Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, better late than never. The UK is accused of joining the race to court Africa late as Theresa May heads to the continent in a bid to drum up a post Brexit deal. Prime Minister throws some shapes as her three nation African charm offensive starts in Cape Town. We meet some of the rare Mauritanian female faces hoping for more prominent roles in politics as the country gears up for a host of elections this weekend. And as China's investment in Africa grows, so does its influence. And not always in business. The traditional Chinese therapy of acupuncture is growing increasingly popular in Congo Brazzaville. We take a closer look. But first, UK Prime Minister Theresa May headed to Cape Town on Tuesday. She kicked off a bid to woo African business and support in a post-Brexit world. The UK quits the EU next March and is in a race to court ties around the world before then. Theresa May's pledged to invest billions in African economies and announced the UK's first post-Brexit trade pact. Nicola Chemin tells us more. <laughs> Theresa May's day started off with a few dance moves in a Cape Town school. It was the first visit by a British Prime Minister to Sub-Saharan Africa in nearly five years. Analysts said it was an effort to reinforce Britain's global objectives ahead of leaving the European Union. I can today announce a new ambition. By 2022, I want the UK to be the G7's number one investor in Africa. With Britain's private sector companies taking the lead, in investing the billions that will see African economies growing by trillions. Theresa May met South African President Cyril Ramaphosa and announced a 4.4 billion euro Africa investment program. Both our countries have identified key sectors for investment to boost economic growth and in our case to continue to create jobs and to reduce poverty in South Africa. May said Britain would host an African investment summit next year. She has also asked for new diplomatic missions to be opened across the continent. There was a solemn ceremony during which May presented Ramaphosa with the bell from the troop ship Mendy. It sank in the channel in 1917, drowning more than 600 mainly South African troops who were to join the Allies in World War I. After South Africa, May will visit Nigeria on Wednesday and Kenya on Thursday. Look now at some news in brief. South African lawmakers have withdrawn a bill allowing the compulsory purchases of land in a bid to tackle the racial imbalance in ownership. White people are still own the majority of deeds in the country and the original expropriation bill would have allowed the state to pay for land at a value determined by a government adjudicator and then seize it for the public interest. Well, that's now been pulled following plans announced earlier this month to change the constitution to allow expropriation without compensation. The ruling ANC party said that should the bill be reintroduced, it would contain clauses reflecting this. Kenya's deputy chief justice is due to appear in court on Wednesday to face charges of abuse of office and tax evasion. Justice Philomena Miwilu is the country's second highest judge. She was arrested on Tuesday before being granted bail of over 40,000 euros. She was among the judges who annulled President Uhuru Kenyatta's initial election win last August. Sudan claims that South Sudanese rebel chief Rik Machar has agreed to sign a final peace deal with Juba to end five years of brutal civil war. He earlier refused to agree to signing, but media say that he's out. He, he's agreed to put pen to paper on Thursday. Machar and South Sudanese President Salva Kiir have held weeks of talks in Khartoum. Previous peace deals have proved short-lived and fragile. Now, the ICC's chief prosecutors called on judges at the International Criminal Court to convict a former Congolese warlord Bosco Taganda because of overwhelming evidence that he personally committed crimes against humanity. Taganda faces 18 counts of war crimes committed in 2002 to 2003 when he was deputy chief of staff of the UPC militia group in the east of DR Congo. He's denied all the charges. Prosecutor Fatou Bensouda told the court the case was a chance to recognize the sexual enslavement of soldiers as a separate crime within the court's jurisdiction. 
evidence proves that Boscon Taganda personally committed crimes. He persecuted and attacked civilians. He murdered them, pillaged their goods, destroyed their churches and hospitals. Boscon Taganda and his co-perpetrators not only terrorized the civilian population, they terrorized their own troops. They forced the children in their army to kill. They treated them cruelly. They raped and sexually enslaved them. Mauritania heads to the polls this weekend for regional, municipal and legislative elections. Less than half a dozen seats have been reserved for women on the National Assembly and female politicians are still relatively rare. Less than two dozen seats, excuse me. Our correspondents tell us more and have spoken to two women hoping for more prominent political roles. Habi is one of Mauritania's opposition party anti-slavery activists. She lives on the outskirts of the capital, Nouakchott, and this year, the 50-year-old is running in the legislative elections. Although slavery has been abolished here for 30 years, rights group estimate that 20% of the population is still enslaved. Habi is driven by her painful personal experience of the practice. My candidacy is the result of my fight against slavery. I myself was a slave, but I was freed. I still suffer the consequences of what happened to me. Due to the searing daytime heat, campaigning takes place at night in Wakshot. Habi goes out to meet her supporters at neighborhood rallies. Many of them are descendants of slaves from the Harriton community. It's Mauritania's largest minority group and is who Habi hopes to represent in parliament. Once I am elected, I will immediately claim my rights and the rights of my parents, my parents who died. I am going to fight, fight for those who are still in slavery. Fatimatu Abdel Malik is another rare female face in this year's race. She's a member of the ruling party and running in the regional elections. She's come from a civil society background and is well known in Mauritania for her commitment to improving women's rights and helping the needy. I helped the disabled. She's happy about that. Even if the women here have a special, relatively privileged status in Mauritanian society, they're not present in the political sphere. It's a way to support them, to make them aware of their rights, their interests and especially their future. With an unprecedented 105 political parties voting in the elections, female candidates have 20 seats reserved for them in the 157-seat National Assembly. Now, as China's investment in Africa grows, so does its influence, and not always only in business. The traditional Chinese therapy of acupuncture is growing increasingly popular in Congo Brazzaville. Take a look. In Congo Brazzaville, more and more patients are receiving acupuncture treatment. The traditional Chinese therapy is delivered by Chinese doctors in this hospital that was funded by Beijing. I once had acupuncture treatment back in 1989, and it went very well. Two years ago, I was referred by a local hospital for lumbar disc surgery, but I said no. Instead, I turned to acupuncture treatment here, which again healed my spine problem. The therapy is increasingly popular and some in Congo Brazzaville want to learn how to practice acupuncture. I found many locals go to China to study traditional Chinese medicine practice. It's a choice they made after having a deeper and better understanding of the medical system. China's first medical team arrived in Africa in 1963. Since then, Beijing has sent doctors to 45 African countries. Traditional Chinese medicine includes various forms of herbal medicine, massages, dietary therapies and acupuncture. One big advantage of traditional Chinese medicine is that it is easy to perform and it doesn't have high requirements for medical equipment. Take acupuncture and sticking plaster, for example. They are easy to conduct or use and it's cheap. China doesn't only send doctors to Africa. For nine years now, it has overtaken the U.S. as Africa's largest trading partner. It has spent billions of dollars on infrastructure on the continent, but its critics say it uses mostly Chinese firms and laborers. 
Earlier this year, Washington even said African countries should be careful not to forfeit their sovereignty when they accept loans from Beijing. Well, that's it for I in Africa for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care.